Good evening, and welcome to a Nightline Face-Off. Our question tonight is a very provocative one. Does Satan exist? According to one recent poll, 70% of Americans believe, yes, Satan does exist. But who or what is he? Is he a fallen angel, or is he some sort of formless, malevolent force in the universe? And if he doesn't exist, how do we explain why there is so much pain, suffering, and violence in the world today? This is a discussion that opens up a, a whole series of fascinating and fundamental questions about good and evil, about human nature, and the nature of God. It is also a discussion that is likely to provoke some very strong emotions. It is entirely possible that there are people here on this stage with me tonight who believe that others on the stage are doing, if only unwittingly, the work of Satan. It is also possible that there are people on this stage who believe that believing in Satan is dangerous, wrong, and destructive. So let's get right to the discussion, and we're going to start with opening statements. And uh, we're going to go first to Pastor Mark Driscoll. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Mark Driscoll, preaching pastor at Mars Hill Church. And Christians have always believed that there are great distinctions between the creator and the creation, that God is eternal, he is good, he is loving, he is powerful. God made both that which is material and that which is spiritual. And God gave both angels and also human beings free will. Satan was an angel who rebelled against God. In so doing, led an insurrection. Other angels followed him. Our first parents joined that rebellion. And ultimately, that is the cause of moral evil. It is rebellion against God. Everything God made, he declared to be very good. And all that is very bad is because of sin. That is our responsibility as well as Satan's. And God is so good and so gracious that though he is creator and we are creation, he entered into creation as the man Jesus Christ. He came on a rescue mission to save us from sin, from death, from folly, and ultimately from Satan who is our enemy. Jesus lived without sin. He contended with Satan. He was tempted and opposed by Satan. He never yielded to him. He never did sin. He went to the cross, and in great affection, he substituted himself for sinners like me, and he died in our place for our sin. So that is the essential belief of Christianity, that Satan is real, but so is Jesus, and he works out all things for good, and ultimately, he will redeem all that has been lost through Satan's sin and death. Thank you. We're going to go now to Deepak Chopra for an opening statement. I'm Deepak Chopra, and I think our consciousness, or if you will, our soul, is a place of contrast, because all creation occurs through contrast. You have up and down, you have hot and cold, you have light and darkness. So our essential state is one of ambiguity and ambivalence. And Freud, the great psychiatrist in the last century, the psychologist said that uh, neurosis and sometimes even psychosis is the inability to tolerate our ambiguity. The fact that we are sacred and profane at the same time, that we are divine and diabolical at the same time, that uh, we can have forbidden lust on the one hand and unconditional love on the other. This is the human condition that there's a part of us that is called the shadow. And this is a relatively recent idea. The shadow is that part of us that is fearful, that is uh, diabolical, that is uh, scared, that has guilt and shame, that is in denial, and that believes in sin. It comes from separation from our divine source. If we want to understand the nature of evil in the world, we need to understand the nature of our own shadows. We need to embrace them, we need to forgive them, we need to share them with each other, and we need to confront them. It is my belief that people who obsess over sin, people who obsess over guilt and shame, and unfortunately, there are religious institutions that have actually idealized guilt and shame and made it into a virtue. And when we obsess over these things and we collectively create this obsession, then we project it out there as this mythical figure that we call Satan. Healthy people do not have any need for Satan. Healthy people 
need to confront their own issues, understand themselves, and move towards the direction of compassion, creativity, understanding, context, insight, inspiration, revelation, and understanding that we are part of an ineffable mystery. That the moment we label that mystery as good and evil, right and wrong, then we create conflict in the world, and that all the trouble in the world today is between religious ideologies. There are approximately 30 wars going on in the world, and they're mostly in the name of God. So I would say, be done with Satan and confront your own issues. Healthy people do not have a need for Satan. I think we're going to hear a very different perspective from Annie Lobert now. Hi, I'm Annie Lobert, and I have a ministry called Hookers for Jesus. And as you probably don't know or do know, I am a former escort, prostitute, stripper, what have you. I came to Las Vegas to seek fame, fortune, and materialism. I was actually seeking a college degree, compromised my integrity because I wanted something that I saw others have. I was very empty inside. I was very unloved. I hated myself. And my own feelings you know, of not feeling love because God is love and I didn't realize it. I went to Sunday school. I was in a denomination where I was taught that God was angry at every, anything that we would do that was wrong. And I veered off towards the angry side because I didn't understand God and I was afraid of God because I had a lot of issues going on with um, my family life and my personal life in school. And so I ran from my problems and I went to Vegas because I thought having what the world showed us on MTV in pop culture, in all the magazines, would cure that feeling inside me and take it away. And for a couple of years, it was really fun. I, I had a blast. I had Mercedes. I had, you know, any kind of diamonds I wanted to wear. I had nice houses. I was living the life. I had a pimp. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And as I continued to get raped and beat up by my pimp and treated bad by my clients, slapped, put in trunks, kidnapped, I faced death, I can't even count how many times. And I lived this lifestyle for 16 years. I saw 10 of my friends die. And there night came in my life where I faced death. I OD'd on cocaine because I hated myself. And I kept hearing voices to tell me to kill myself. There was no reason to go on. And I know that wasn't coming from inside of me. There was a diabolical force speaking to me. And I truly believe it was the devil and his demons. And the devil almost got my life. And that night, I made myself real to God, and I asked him to come into my heart and save me. Save me from him, myself, and the bad decisions I had made. And he did. And now I reach out to prostitutes. And I do believe the devil is real, and it's what's controlling them, and it's what's making them trapped in the industry. And I'm here to tell the truth tonight. Thank you. Welcome. Carlton Pearson. Very touching story, um, deeply touching to me, and it's awkward for me to be here tonight because I'm from a, a uh, four generations of demon caster outers. Um, I had tremendous faith in the devil, in his, in his power, in his omnipresence, in his omniscience, this faceless, ubiquitous, hairy, horny in my imagination, uh, hoofed, fanged beast that was a nemesis to God, but I couldn't see it or him. I've heard that it's also she. Um, if I saw a press prostitute, that would have been the devil. Um, and I would cast the devil out of her, and I have, with them frothing and writhing on the floor. But here's why I cast the devil out of them. First, I believed in the devil enough and in demons if, I, if it wasn't the devil it was one of his legions he had billions of demons all over the world and a lot of them were in my church my mom and dad their parents we believed in it and we inculcated it and we cultured it and we we navigated it and we investigated it and we interrogated it and we I, it was almost like a form of devil worship I wouldn't have called it that so when that thing manifested that I had invented 
and people invent them. I cast it out. When people come to me who are demon-possessed, I know what they're thinking. So I went there. But I don't actually believe. I've been thinking, well, maybe I invented that. Maybe I called it into being. Because I've never seen the devil. I haven't really seen God. I just believe. And it's interesting that we have as much faith in the devil. In fact, it's an article of the Christian faith almost anymore. Christians will sometimes uh, defend the devil more than they will God. So anyway, um, I, I have reassessed all that. And I think that the best way to get people free is to get them to stop believing so much in this hairy, horny, freaky, scary, omnipresent entity. And it will not manifest the way we have believed it to. And that will bring uh, an element of peace, the psychosis, the pathological fear that many people have in all the religious faiths, not just Christianity, but Hindu, uh, Judaism, and, and particularly the Abrahamic faith, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. We really believe in that. We call them the great Satan. They call us the great Satan, and we drop bombs on each other because we so believe in the Satan. We're trying to kill it by dropping bombs on countries and cultures, and I think Jesus would not support that. Pastor Mark, if God is a loving God, why would he create Satan? I think he created angels and people, and he gave us the capacity to have free will. For there to be virtue, there must be the possibility of vice. And uh, that's what distinguishes those of us, people and angels, from other forms of creation, trees, animals and the like. We have volitional will, we have consciousness, we have moral decision making. And so God didn't create evil. God didn't create injustice or tyranny or oppression. He created free will in angels and people. And Satan and the demons and human beings have chosen to disobey, to rebel, and that's the source of the trouble. And so he can create us and he can create the devil and we can engage in evil, but he didn't create that. The no, initially, according to the teaching of the Bible, uh, Satan was an angel. Angels are perfectly good. Those that didn't rebel, um, the Bible says that they honor God and they help us. And they are spirit beings that assist in God's purposes on the earth. So Satan started as one of those and then went astray. And so he walked away from God's intention for him. He's a rebel. So why would God allow somebody who's an avowed enemy of God to continue to exist? Why doesn't God just stop him? Yeah, and the point of the cross of Jesus, according to Colossians 2, is that on the cross, in dying for our sins, Jesus canceled the right that Satan had to rule over us, to influence our thoughts, to have an effect on our eternity, and that ultimately Jesus is coming back to put a final end to Satan and his work. So we're in the middle of history, and the Bible says that God works out all things for good, and so ultimately Satan will be ultimately finally defeated. Uh, sin and all of its effects will be lifted, and the earth and humanity will be returned back to the state that God intended, which was very good. So even though God loves us, he does allow Satan to exist in our lives, tempt us, and make us miserable. Uh, and he also sends Jesus to die for our sins, sends God the Holy Spirit to tell us the truth so we don't believe his lies, to give us the strength to say no to his temptations, and he allows and enables us to win in the battle that we are in spiritually. Why create that choice? Why not just let everything be peaceful? Well, I think if you don't allow choice, the theologians will say you don't have love. That love requires volition and that God does not want automatons, he wants persons. And so the argument is made that if God were not allowing choice, then you wouldn't have evil, but you would also not have love. It's actually a little difficult for me to respond because everything he says is in contradiction to what we know about the physical universe that began about 13.8 billion years ago in something called the Big Bang. Our planet Earth is only about 3.5 billion years old. Uh, the first microorganisms known as chemolithoautotrophic hyperthermophiles evolved around 2.5 billion years ago. Human beings have been on this planet for only 200,000 years. We've had self-awareness, written language for about 5,000 years, oral language for about 15,000 years, 
and self-awareness for about four or five thousand years when all these literatures evolved. So the Bible that he quotes as authority is totally in contradiction with everything that we know about cosmology, about evolution, about biology, about mathematics, about physics, and about everything that allows us to understand who we are. Which doesn't mean that we've solved the mystery of our existence, which does not deny that there may be a divine intelligence at the heart of creation that is ineffable, that is mysterious, that is sacred. But to suddenly call God a he, I've, I've been hearing all this terminology. How come you're all so convinced that God is a he and Satan is a he? How come we have these ideas that are so mythical, that are so primitive? Why don't we understand that so-called evil is a part of ourselves? Annie said it so elegantly when she said, I was full of guilt and shame. That's what you confronted. Now you want to put that guilt and shame to some mythical identity out there? And yet you did that, but then you took responsibility for your own self. Why don't you give the credit to you? The universe has destruction. Nature is capricious, but nature is not evil. There are forces of entropy, there are forces of evolution, and we do have free will. We can choose one or the other, but let's not create primitive ideas about these notions. I want to let Annie respond to that directly. Okay, thank you. Um, Deepak, thank you for your rebuttal. Um, I've, asked, I've had people ask me that question before, and I truly believe that the devil was in my life because God wanted to show me how much he really loved me. And I can't explain it any other way. I never would have known God's love had I not been maliciously attacked by the demons that he sent towards me. I wouldn't be who I am today, and I'm, I'm just a changed person that lives a fantastic life now. And prior to meeting the devil, prior to even meeting God, my life was just flatline. And so I'm alive because God created me, and he created the devil. And I embrace, I embrace the Lord. What, what convinces you that God is a he? Jesus. Jesus. Gee, you may have heard of him. Really big dude. <laughs> really big dude. That's we what we're talking about, right, Annie? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, my God is not a sexist God. Thank God. Well, we have, we have not heard from Bishop Pearson. How do you square the notion of a loving God with the existence of a devil? I have to dance around because I know the scriptures that, that they so uh, believe in and that I've preached all my life and studied in college. Um, and a lot of our fundamentalist appraisals about anything are based on scripture. I think that we create these things that God would not, in fact, and let me quote another scripture, that scripture says that God created everything and that everything that God created is good. And John says that everything that God created, everything that is created, God created. So if everything that is created, God created, and everything that God created is good, then what is evil? but some aspect of good, possibly perverted or contorted or inaccurate or misunderstood if we just have to have evil. So it's confusing to, to see God with two faces. One, he's loving, and as, as Deepak mentioned, and then he has this customized torture chamber where he's going to send all your relatives who aren't saved, and you if you smoke. So, um, <laughs> I mean, you confess Christ, you come to Jesus, you come to church, you tithe, you give, and you do all that first, then you mustn't smoke, you mustn't fuss, cuss, or lust. Don't drink beer, don't wear makeup if you're a woman, and don't wear britches. I mean, there's a lot of rules that we add in our, in our fundamentalist modes. And the Muslims do the same thing, and some parts of, of Judaism. And so we do add a lot of laws, and the more laws you make, the more laws you break, and then when you break the law, you're turned over to God who judges you, and then he turns you over to the devil. And then the devil tortures you. A lot of that is fairy tale, a lot of that is superstition, a lot of that is myth. And I, it's, it's stunning for me to say that because I have preached the typical fundamentalist gospel all my life. For me to say that the devil isn't real, real when I actually cast one out, I'm saying you believe, what you believe you create, you become what you think about. If you're thinking about devils, you will have them. And so I, I don't necessarily believe in a God or the God. I just believe in God, some ultimate intelligence that I experience and may not know. I love God, 
I don't know how not to. But I'm still learning how to love God, believe in God, and leave the devil where y'all found him. Because that him or her or it does create a manifestation of that reality in your life. If you believe in a God who's violent and angry and vicious and judgmental and wrathful, tells you to, to love your enemies, but he, he holds 6,000 or 200,000 years, according to Deepak, grudges or how many millions of years grudges against people, a 16-year-old kid who never met Jesus and went to hell, and Hitler, who also believed in Jesus and thought he was doing God's will by torturing the Jews. Where did he learn to burn them? Except from our scriptures that says God's going to ultimately burn everybody. So uh, I'm re readdressing, rethinking all that stuff, and I don't believe in the fairy tale aspect. I believe in the mystical Jesus rather than the mythical Jesus. First of all, the, the, the Satan that you present isn't the one that the Bible does. Uh, he's not all powerful, all knowing, all present. He's created and limited. <laughs> And so the, the Satan you reject is the Satan that the Bible in front of me rejects. Additionally, uh, to say that he's fanged and hoofed, the Bible doesn't say that. That's, you know, Bugs Bunny, Roadrunner. Um, that's sort of their version of it. It's fairy tale, and I don't believe that is the case. But the problem is, is you've got to account for evil in some way. Despite all the wars we have fought, all the blood that has been shed, all the dollars that have been spent, all the elections that have been held in all the programs that have been instituted, evil, injustice, and sin still occurs. And if you say that there is no source for that, and that's Deepak's position, he holds to one. There's one circle and everything's in it. God, Satan, good, evil, physical, spiritual, everything is one. What I believe is two. There's creator, creation. There is good, there is evil. There is God and there is Satan. They are not equal, but they are in conflict. And that gives me great joy because it means there's someone outside to judge what's going on. And there's also someone from the outside to come in and rescue. And that's why we love Jesus so much. When the scripture says Jesus was manifested for the purpose to destroy, what? To put an end to the devil's work. The works of the devil. Do you believe that? I believe Satan will have his day. And that will be the end of him. I do believe we are in the middle of history. And I read the end of the book, and I think it's going to go real well for Jesus. So when Je <laughs> yeah. go ahead. But he, but Jesus said, this is the, so the Christian, Jesus said it is finished. What was finished? The work of salvation, the means by which we can be reconciled to God and the sin and rebellion that we have participated in, that that is removed, that guilt is removed. So there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. I agree with Deepak. Condemnation and guilt and shame. Let's get rid of that. So let's, let's go to Jesus to get rid of that. Deepak just wanted to weigh in for something. No, I just want to say it's important for us to recognize that we have a darkness inside us. Nobody is saying that we don't. There's a part of us that is dark, that is secretive that is irrational, that is primitive, that uh, uh, is shrouded in mythology, and we project that outside instead of taking responsibility for it. And once we confront these issues in ourselves, then we don't need a Satan. And I do believe that love is the ultimate truth. I do believe that God is love, but that love transcends good and bad. It transcends good and evil. It is of a much higher order. For creation to occur, you need to have contrast. For You need to have pleasure in order to contrast it with pain. You need to have up and down, cold and hot. So, you know, these are forces of nature. Nature can be capricious, but nature is not evil. Evil has only appeared in the world when human beings show up. And right. I'm going to pick on you, Bishop. Um, you still have the title bishop, and as far as I know, you still consider yourself a Christian, uh, a follower of Jesus. Jesus spoke repeatedly about Satan and demons, and my question to you is, can you pick and choose what you believe from the Bible? Actually, yes, and I'll tell you why. No, I'll tell you why. Because the Bible is a several thousand year old document that we have none of the original letters, none of the original manuscripts. It was all handwritten. You've got to remember this wasn't mass-produced until 1400 years after Jesus. 
So we have all these hundreds of years of men revising the Bible. We have, it was spoken in Aramaic and the Old Testament Hebrew, then translated into Greek and to Latin and to German, and then 16th century King's English. The words have different meanings. To talk about this very sensitive subject, you have to talk about the Bible. And do you believe it's the inerrant, infallible word of the living God, which I preach with the best and rest of them. And I do not believe it is the inspired word of God as much as I believe it's the inspired word of man about God as best as man can perceive. But the finite cannot perceive the infinite. You can experience infinity and not know it. So the Bible, like the devil, is something we have put together to try to explain darkness and death and light and fear and lightning. And I hate to say this because I know it makes some of you uncomfortable. Christianity has borrowed a lot of myth. And the writers, and remember, we cannot prove any of the letters to be authentic because they appeared as many as 70 years after the writers were dead. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the God. And I believe that stuff, most of it, but I'm telling you a critical analysis of the thing we idolize as the Bible uh, could be very possibly inaccurate. And it's okay to rethink some of these things and still love God and be a follower of Jesus and love people and worship in any way you the entire time that you were talking, you were talking about the age of the Bible and who wrote it and everything like that. It's totally irrelevant to me. I'm just being honest with you because I experienced my life. And everything in the Bible that I've read has absolutely come true in my life. If, if I could say that the Bible is absolutely true, it's by my own experience and my own personal life that's shown to be changed through God. And um, that's where I stand on it. I totally believe the Bible is absolutely the 100% valuable word of God. And anything that you add to it or take it away makes it null and void. So when you add, you know, your own thoughts or your own consciousness of what you think it really means, it's not going to work for you. It's, it's not the truth. And you become deceived when you start thinking that you can go, go to God or go to heaven in any way, any form, just by what you're thinking in your heart. There has to be a standard. There has to be a rule book for the way to go. And we can't defer to the left or to the right of it because... Then we start to sin, and then the devil comes in and steals our joy. Mark? I mean, some of the claims are poor academically, and you're a nice guy. And we're, um, I mean, you know, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's men like Karsten Peter Thede who would date fragments of Matthew back to uh, the time when the eyewitnesses were still alive. Uh, those who did write the Bible weren't making things up. They got murdered. Peter was crucified upside down. Uh, usually for something like that, there's a benefit. Um, not, you don't tell that kind of lie uh, for Jesus' own mother to worship him, his own brothers to worship him, his own brother to suffer as a pastor, to say, this is what people made up. Do you, do you really think that people got together and said, let's create a religion in which there's only one way to heaven, we're all sinners, and hell's hot, and forever's a long time, and actually voted on that, and this is what we ended up with. I mean, were it invented, I, I think we would end up with something totally different, like salvation by eating chicken wings and napping, you know? That's what I would have voted for. The, the scripture says, the letter, or literal, kills. That's where we get the word literal from letter. Spirit gives life. I take the Bible very seriously, just not literally. Now, if you want to be really strict, you're not supposed to wear expensive clothes or jewelry. That's not true. Well, uh, according to the New Testament, no. Nope, but nope. it's not true. She might have shopped on sale. <laughs> you're judging. Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't literally. I've said this to many great I've, I've hosted conference, conferences with Christians for 40 and 50,000 people there every year for 15 years. And we dress women wear pearls and gold and braided hair. So, uh, and, but the, the, the New Testament says that a woman should not wear braided hair. All right, what, one no, question. No, That's a hard. literal. You know. The part where it says Jesus got out of the grave, yes or no? Yes. So Th Does what? Does the Bible that, say that? he rose from death. Do you yes, believe sir. that? Yes. And you have a problem with the devil and not the resurrection? <laughs> no. No, here's where I am. Here, here's where I am. The resurrection is very powerful to our faith. Nobody can prove it. I've been to the t garden tomb. I've wept seeing the empty tomb. And, but I can't prove that. I believe that because I want to believe it. I don't think I have to believe it for it to have happened or not happened. I've been taught to believe it. I don't know how not to, you know. 
So that's that's so when our Christian goes to the Gordon to and the Catholics go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and they argue as they were fighting over there the other day about where Jesus was buried, you know, it, there's a lot of mis misinformation in that. But go, all right, all right, Deepak, go I deep. Have, I have a suspicion that Deepak has something to say. <laughs> all I have to say is belief is a cover up for insecurity. All belief is a cover up for insecurity. If I asked you, do you believe in electricity, you would say that's ridiculous. If I asked you, do you believe in gravity or electromagnetism, you would say that's a stupid question. If something is real, you don't have to believe in it. You should be able to experience it. And the most fervent believers in the world are the cause of all the problems in the world right now. Okay. But Deepak, so, Annie, Annie has said repeatedly that she did experience her. Say that? Annie has said repeatedly that she did experience Well, her. then I don't deny her, her experience for her. And I had one too. You know? Uh -huh. And I have one too. But if you ask me, do you believe in the literal resurrection? Do you believe in the literal virgin birth? So, good for them. And bad for you. Right? Say, say that again. I'm bad for you. Thank, thank you for having at least the intention of saving me. I don't know what I would do in the absence of people. I like love you. you and I want good for you. Thank you, sir. I do. People I'm believing. doing okay. You know, I don't need the devil because I don't have the guilt and shame that you people have. I don't have guilt and shame. I used to. I used to. And then being forgiven. Listen. And then I don't need to rejoice in myself. I get the joy of thanking someone rather than being proud. Everyone is saying what they're saying from their level of consciousness. And actually, there's no need for debate here because everyone totally believes in their truth. Well, the debate is not for you guys. It's for the people at home. Yeah, and sure. they may be learning something. Annie. You know, when you were saying that, you know, who causes their own mess? Well, I want to know something. If you're getting attacked by someone and raped, and let's just say you were just walking to your car, did you cause that mess? No, you didn't cause that. But you know, we live in a society that has abuse, that has uh, poverty, that has ignorance, that is a result of cultural influences, historical influences, economic influences. It's not so simple that you cause that. When you look at the context in which evil arises, there's a deeper understanding of why it's there. And you because then try self. and solve because it self, creatively selfishness. instead of creating some bogeyman out there Well, Satan. Well, so you, you believe, you believe that evil exists? I definitely believe that there are forces of destruction in the world and that this is part of our essential nature, that we have the choice to be good or evil, as, as he said. We have the choice to choose evolution or entropy, but we don't have to project it on some mythical being out there. You believe in evil? Yes. I believe that there are destructive forces, mm -hmm. but when you add rage to that, that becomes evil, and I, I believe that that is a manifestation of ourselves, that how, we don't have to have a bogeyman to blame it so on. How do you explain all of the pain, the suffering, the rage, and the violence in the world without a Satan figure? You explain it because of ignorance, the fact that we think of ourselves as separate from each other, the fact that we identify ourselves with our race, with our religion, with our culture, and that's our limited identity, that we don't understand that there's a deeper humanity where we are all inseparable from each other, that we have an experience of love and compassion that is authentic, that we realize that there's no me without you. When I can see myself in you, no matter how evil you are, then I have a deeper understanding of you as well. You know, the divine and the diabolical are different faces of the infinite. Their will, it's the divine feeling ill. So well, let, me get a, let me get a response from you two on that. Uh, the, the notion that what's at the source of our suffering is ignorance as opposed to, to use Deepak's term, a, an external boogeyman. How he also think? said that there are more wars and death than ever at the same time that he would say that there is greater enlightenment, evolution, and education than ever, and how higher consciousness could lead to higher evil 
than is contradictory in his own system. Whenever you have evolution, then the fearful forces get even more fearful. So, you know, so-called evil tries to keep pace with evolution. But evolution is always ahead of entropy. That's the, otherwise we wouldn't have evolution. You know, the fact that we have evolution, evolution is ahead. But as soon as, you know, you move to the next stage of consciousness, then the fearful forces, they get, there's more turbulence. When there's a phase transition in thinking, then people whose primitive beliefs are threatened, they become even more fearful and therefore more destructive. But you talk it's about fear but you more talk than about anything love else. and compassion and unity and keep demeaning people by calling them primitive. I don't know how those work together. I think, you know, we have to understand that there are different levels of understanding. I'm not calling them evil. I'm calling them primitive. <laughs> and you don't think that's a bit pretentious? I think, I think... I mean, Deepak is here and then no, others no, no, are here and listen, rednecks are down at the bottom. You're putting, you're putting all your faith in that book, which no. was written 5,000 years no. ago. I, I put my faith in the man that this book tells the story of. It, you put your faith in the English version of the man who tells the story. You know, if you had ever written, uh, read about the other scholarly work that has been done, about the fact that Jesus spoke in Aramaic with his name is Yeshua Bar Al-Aha, and when people quote the Gospel of John and say, you know, no one comes into the uh, kingdom of heaven except through me, well, do you know that the Aramaic word for me is ena, ena, which means the eye within the eye, which means the spirit. When Jesus is talking to the crowd in the Gospel of John, when people start to stone him, and he says, many good works have I shown you, for which of these do you stone me? And they say, we stone you not for a good work that you do, we stone you for blasphemy because you, being a man, call yourself a god. And what does Jesus do? He quotes from the scripture, Old Testament, goes back to the time of King David, uh, speaks from the song of Asaph, which was written a thousand years before him. He says, is it not written in your law that you are gods? If it can be said of those to whom the word, the logos, the knowledge of God came, the consciousness of God came, that they are gods, then why do you say I blaspheme? And if you go back to the Hebrew, the word God means ruler and those in authority, not divinity. You can pull out the Aramaic and you're ignoring the Hebrew back in Psalms. He doesn't say we're divine. He says we have authority and we're rulers and we're responsible Does for the decisions we make. Does he not say elsewhere all things that I do, you can do and more? Does he not say I and the Father are one? I am in you, you are in me. Does he not say abide in me as I abide in you? What does it mean to abide in you? It means that God puts his spirit within us, not that we're part of the karmic consciousness. I still see too, creator, creation. And by God coming for me, giving me his spirit, that connects me to him through Jesus, but that does not make me God. And what of all the people in the world who never heard of Jesus? Are they damned forever? What of all the people who lived before Jesus, who was only a little more than 2,000 years ago? What about them? Those were... And there are millions of them. Two things. One, ultimately, there was anticipation more than 2,000 years ago for the coming of Jesus. The Jews had a clear concept of the Messiah. Secondly, it is God who saves. Unlike your system, where there is no one outside of the system, my God comes into the system and he saves. And he can save anyone he likes. He can save people anywhere, anytime. And God is gracious and loving, so I trust God to do what is okay, best. By the way, I don't have a system. I have only fun, one philosophy. Well, for a guy I, with higher I consciousness, want to, I expect I want more. to seek the company of those. I want to seek the company of those who are looking for the truth, but I want to run away from those who have found it. Well, Jesus said he was the truth, and that's what I'm looking for. Okay, one last question from me, uh, and this is for Annie. Annie, how do, how do you conceive of the the devil, of Satan? Is it as we see in the cartoons? Uh, red guy with horns? Is it, a, is it an impersonal force? What, in your mind, how do you view Satan? I don't think of him as the man with the horns or the weird gargoyle face or anything like that. My experience personally, I never saw his face. I saw demons, and I don't even want to tell you what they look like. I was held down by demons at night, uh, raped by them. 
I know this might sound crazy to some of you, but it really happened, and it happens to a lot of the women in the sex industry. When you sleep with a lot of men, you pull a lot, a lot of the things that are in their lives, which is, you know, debauchery, because they're searching for a woman and paying for sex, and it's against what God believes in, because ultimately, God doesn't hate sex. He loves sex. He wants us to be in a consecrated relationship with someone. Marriage, okay, just like our relationship with him. He wants us to be true to him. And when we go outside of the context of marriage, we, we end up bringing all kinds of bad things like adultery, uh, uh, diseases happen with sex. So when a woman sleeps with a man for money or even not for money and she sleeps around and becomes promiscuous, she ends up picking up a lot of the bad things that the men are asking her for. And so it opens up all kinds of doors for bad things to happen. I've woken up with scratches on my body. Um, I have just, I've had the worst experience. I, I had... When you say you've been held down, I'm mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt, but when you say you were held down by demons, yes. do you mean actual supernatural beings or yes. demons? Yes, I could not, I could not physically see them though. I was held down, I could not move. And I could not, I could not see anything, but when I was... And were these their clients? No, you... you know, no, there was nobody in the room, I was by myself. It's impossible. But I actually had men choke me and then uh, when I came to, I saw red eyes and black faces. And I didn't recognize the person that was choking me. Didn't know where I was. And I know I do believe that part of your brain does get damaged from being choked. But how do you explain the face? How do you explain the nasty feeling that you have and the death feeling and the feeling that you're getting pulled into hell? That, that is not created. That, that is something by, by yourself. That is something that... that gets brought into you because there's devils and demons attacking you. So you imagine uh, one Satan who is the, um, the, the chief. He's the ruler of the And the then demons. there are a legion of demons. Yes, legion. And there's do you imagine of them. them as, as uh, uh, be beings with bodies or, or spirits? They're, they're spirits. They float around like the, because they're fallen angels. There's legions of them. And they, they attach to us in different ways. And they, they enter us through a fence and, and self just... Trying to please ourselves all the time. Selfishness, uh, you know, jealousy, anger, rage, whatever emotion that we're feeling, they can enter and they can actually make us do wrong decisions. So the way they work is by entering people. Well, they can't enter a Christian because when a Christian's saved, they're, they're protected by Jesus. They can oppress a Christian, but when someone's not saved by Christ, they can actually enter and they can control your life and make, make you make bad decisions. Put voices in your head. You should do this. And it's always about self. A demon will never tell you to go save someone. Am I right, Mark? It will never tell you to go give something to someone, you know, for someone that's hungry. They're always going to speak about, what are you going to get out of this? Well, what's it going to make you look like? Well, how popular will you be? Or how rich will you be? Or don't you need to satisfy yourself? I mean, you've worked so hard. Why don't you just go sleep with 10 guys, make some money? Come on, you deserve it. That's what a demon would say to me. Why can't, why can't that voice just be your ego? Or it can just be your ego your combined with the demon. That's what happened to me personally. What if there's no demon whatsoever? It's just the way the mind works. The mind has bad impulses and positive impulses. I believe that our mind does have bad and, and positive and negative impulses, but it's always by a source that's influencing it, whether it's good or evil, whether it's God or the devil. There's no in between in that one. She was in a deep, dark, desperate psychological dungeon. And she got out of it and whatever interpretation she has, it works for her. So, you know, that doesn't mean that we all have to accept that interpretation. But we do have demonic impulses, we do have a dark side, and it also arises in the context, you know, it arises in the context of her childhood or whatever influences she had. And, but, you know, let's at least give her credit that whatever she believes in, brought her out of that place. Annie's view of, of the world is a view that you used to share, correct? Yeah, I can relate to her a thousand percent. She just basically said, through her guilt, her sin, her lifestyle, her uh, pimps, she created an atmosphere where manifestation of what she experienced could occur. She created that. And there are other, I, the first girl I cast the devil out of was a Christian, a tongue-talking, Holy Ghost-filled Christian. She's a preacher's wife today. I've never cast the devil out of a prostitute on the street. I, well, I'm in churches like this, packed out all over the world. And Christians who believe in the cross and the blood and Jesus come to me and say, I need deliverance. So we cast the devil out of them because that's what they expect. 
But that's the devil that I had believed in, and I know how to believe in it now. If somebody comes to me frothing and stuff right now, I know what they need to hear. I know what I need to say, and I'll say it. And they'll get up and rejoice and go home. But we both entered and agreed. We agreed that the devil was present. We agreed, agreed that Jesus could deliver. Now, other cultures, go to Africa, where, I, where my ancestry comes from, and they deal with demons differently. They use potions and roots and incantations, and they dance, and then the person goes home free of a cancer, free of some other physical ailment, fear of mental illness. That's the way they dealt with it in that con continent or culture, and they never heard of Jesus. So people find life itself is a kind of a sexually transmitted disease. When I say disease, I mean dis-ease. There's tension. We're not at ease. We're not relaxed. We, 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 we live in this dark night of the soul. Not only Christians and prostitutes. A lot of people, I know preachers who can't sleep at night with whom I prayed in tongues, but who are on drugs and who preach under what I would call the anointing. So don't, you don't, I don't need to go there. I know what I'm talking about. And it's not just prostitutes that experience that. It's prophetesses and preachers and priests and, and bishops, I know them personally. And doctors. And, and psychologists. Doctors. Yeah, psychologists. Well, let me, absolutely. Let me just stop you for one second and go back nature. to Andy for a second. Andy, what Deepak and Carlton seem to be saying is your beliefs are simply the result of trauma you suffered, but, but they're not real. No, they're abs they were I'm absolutely not real. Not real. If they're real to her, they're real. Well, no, but that her view of the world, of there being a Satan and a legion of demons, it's you are very, very clearly saying that's not real. Listen, there are cultural anthropologists to, that say that ritual is a very effective way of treating a person who's otherwise feeling distressed or is in, in a state of dis-ease. But again, you and are... And so these are rituals, whether right. that's but exorcism yes. of uh, the devil or it's some other kind of but, ritual in Africa. But I want to get Annie's response to that because essentially you're psychologizing what to her is a very real, concrete reality. And I yes. want to get your response to that. Yes, absolutely it was real. And I had post-traumatic stress disorder, and many of the women in the industry do. And I know a lot of ladies that had the same experience as me. How could that be if the devil wasn't real? The same instances happening over and over. And death resulted in many parts of it as well. Like I said before, I had 10 friends that have died. Recently, a prostitute died. She was innocent. And her pimp got her. She was 16 years old. Now, if that isn't the devil, we yeah. need to explain where that came the from. Devil, the devil was the pimp. The devil is the murderer. Do you want a devil? It's if you give that to the supernatural, invisible, almost omnipresent entity, you have no control. The pimp did that, not the devil. The prostitute what is the What influenced the pimp to do that? The, the, the pimp's thinking. Really? What influences have, his thinking? We have years of thinking of demons and Because devils. he's offended by something that happened to him in his and past. Angry and angry And when there's offense, the devil comes in and comes and kill, steal, steal, kills, and destroys your mind, everything you do. I, that's your That's what is, he's, he's this father of all lies. That's what he does. He deceives our brain. He deceives our mind you're, and our sweetheart, spirit. Sweetheart, you're quoting scripture, and I understand but that. But it's the truth. I, I know it's that. Happened. Well, it's true to you. But there's a lot of people that don't know those scriptures. And you're, you're putting them in a place where they can't help themselves. See, perception is the ultimate reality, but not necessarily the ultimate truth. If you perceive yourself as being raped by a demon, then you were raped. You could be raped again if you really believe that's possible. Anybody out here who believes that? There are innocent girls right now who are going to be coming up hearing this story. And I understand it. It's very real to you, so I'm not taking that away. But they're going to tell their mother or some psychologist that they were raped by a devil because they now believe it's possible because it's so real. It's I really love you, and I believe in you, and I love what you're doing. So please don't, I don't want to sound unkind. I just know that, that vernacular, that mentality, I understand it 100%. But I'm saying it is not working because to, to attribute to the devil, there's a lot of prostitutes and pimps, and some of them in the pulpit. They're all over. The more you believe that happens, the more it will happen. And if you don't believe it, the culture can induce it. If you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Gentlemen, right there, come on up. My question really goes to all of you. Uh, what happens in the end time? Is, are all persons saved? Uh, is there enlightenment for all persons or all beings? Uh, the teaching of Christianity is that there is life after death, that some go to be with God and some are separated from him forever. 
Another question. Uh, young lady right here in the front in red. How would you handle somebody, say, who murdered someone if there was no good and no evil? Is there, I'm wondering if there's a chance for compassion in that. Is there a chance for, how do you, how do you align yourself with that question if there is no good and no evil? No pure good and no pure evil, just a, uh, a continuum, a spectrum. But we're talking about good and evil, right. and it seems to me that it gives us a good chance to judge. So that if there is no good and no evil, how do you handle your judgment of a person in front of you who has just done something that you think is not right? So if there's somebody in front of you that killed somebody, how would you judge that? And that's back to my initial point. If you believe everything is one, then you can't have good and evil. There's good, evil, yin, yang, there's, there just is. Exactly. If you believe there's God and then creation, so creator, creation, then God has the right to judge what happens in creation. God has the right to provide an objective standard by which we could say rape is bad and murder is bad and it's always bad and it doesn't matter what neighborhood you grew up in or what kind of dad you had, it's still wrong regardless of environmental conditioning. Do you think we need that? I think without that, you've sawn off the limb of morality that you sit on. Is that, is that, then that's important. Uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, if you, can't, if you can't call something wrong and if you can't judge something is wrong, then, uh, then evil just is, and it's tolerated. Here's how I, how I respond to that. Instead of saying right or wrong, good or bad, there's just choices and decisions with consequences. You think that if I punched you, you oh. wouldn't say, Mark, that was bad. No, I'd punch you back first, and then you let you judge. <laughs> yeah. Jesus said, turn, turn, the other turn the other cheek. So what are you talking about? Well, I'm just asking hypothetically. No, let me, let me, let me. You listen. know, I think God and Satan are explicit enemies but implicit allies. They define each other. They work together. Because, you know, you can't have one without the other. It's, a, it's, it's the usual story of contrast. So you make it sound like a sham. I make it sound as a, a truth because you, how do you define the divine without invoking the diabolical? I'll, I'll repeat myself. You make it sound like it's one big sort of practical joke. It's it not is. a practical joke. It's, it is. You, if you have a deeper understanding, <laughs> if you have a deeper understanding of the context in which evil arises, then you don't judge, you don't punish, you try to understand the context and the meaning of how it arose. And then you try to rehabilitate that context so you can actually turn the sinner into the saint. The sinner and the saint are merely exchanging notes. The saint has a past, the sinner has a future. So relax. You, you were saying, you were saying it, it is a sham, this whole notion of yeah, Satan. This whole idea of this fairy tale, like invisible, good God, and bad God, and by the way we're taught in fundamentalism, the bad guy gets most of the people. The world is going to hell. Uh, the whole world is just about going to, a few little righteous Southern Baptists might make it. Um, but by the time we get to whittling it down, just think about what we tell people. That Jesus is triumphant. He said it is finished. That as in Christ, as in Adam, all men die, die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. Sometimes the Bible contradicts itself. But we talk about a triumphant Christ, but we also talk about a triumphant devil that wins the world, is controlling the world, is controlling the economy, is controlling the environment, is controlling this culture, controlling the White House, the Vatican. I mean, we have demonized so much till we realize it. I want to take another question. There's a gentleman in there with a red shirt back there. He's had his hand up for a while. Come up to the microphone. Uh, my, my question's for, for Deepak and, and uh, the bishop. Now, you stated before that all belief is a cover-up for insecurity, right? Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I see. <laughs> yeah. If, if, if something is real, if something is real, you don't need to believe in it. You just experience it. And God is real because we can experience God. 
when we experience love, compassion, insight, inspiration, creativity, revelation, free choice, when we harness our energies to improve the world, we're experiencing God. You don't need to believe in that anymore. Young woman right here in red. Hi, my name's Diana. And my question is, you believe that selfishness is the root of all evil and the devil, is that true? My, my belief is that, uh, that pride underlies sin, and that is where we, we don't consider God or others, we're completely self-consumed, that, that that's the essence of evil. So if that is a given, do you not think it's prideful to believe that you have the corner on the truth and that it's selfish to not entertain other ideas and other cultures' beliefs about, on religion and truth? Um, what you're saying is that I haven't, and so you're judging me for no, judging. No, I'm asking, how do you reconcile the, the notion of evil as selfishness mm -hmm. and not see believing that your own idea as the only idea of truth is not in it of itself selfish? The question is whether or not it's true. The question is whether or not it's true. You might say that something is right. I might say that something is wrong. The question is what is true. Just because I believe something is true doesn't mean I'm selfish. In fact, I might tell you that Jesus loves you and that all your sins can be forgiven. And you can have a new life forever with him. And you may say, that's selfish. I would say, I love you. And no. I want good for you. And that's my way of trying to help. I'm asking, do you think it's selfish to not entertain another idea that someone else could have an idea of salvation that isn't the same as yours, and that that could be equally true? Yeah, and that's why I'm here. I mean, and that's why I have friends that disagree with me and people from other religions, and, and that's why I read broadly in as much as time affords. And it's not that I don't consider other things, but I find my answers in Jesus. Staying on this side is a young man right here. I, I guess, first of all, I have to say that I agree with Mark on that. The Bible is the infallible word of God. Um, I guess most of all my question for you guys is, you keep discounting evil as being something that's made up in our minds and in a problem that we have within us, but at the same time, you hold to the good as though, you know, that's okay. And to me, there seems to be a contradiction there. You either have to believe that God does exist and Satan does exist, or you have to toss them both out the door. You can't hold to one and throw the other one in either direction. Well, the God you believe in, I do throw over, probably, possibly, because you probably see a man sitting on a throne with a, with a beard who's white with a, with, a, with a staff or scepter or something like that. And when I say God, all of you, don't answer me, just what do you think? And when I say devil, what image pops in your mind? I know something does. Uh, if that image is just an image, but you've never encountered, she says she experienced demons, I did too. And I didn't see them, but I heard them snarling, and that's what I, the girl expected to do, and I expected her to do it, and we worked with it. Uh, but what image do you have of God? We, we believe in a personification of destructive forces or energies, or ideologies that can be called, because some of this is semantics. You know, you can say it's a demon, somebody else may say it's just psychotic. In the Bible, they call a lunatic who may be somebody that's bipolar today, and they thought it was demon possession in those days. Jesus cast the devil out of the lunatic. Well, now the scientists call it a, that your lunar is the moon, that when the moon shifts, moods change, barometric pressure changes, women's ovaries respond based on when men have their, every 29 days we go somewhere. So, um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it, but we can demonize it if See, we want to. We're not demonizing The problem, it. my friend, is as soon as you define God, you limit God. Any image of God is a limitation. Because if God is infinite, if God is infinite, then God is beyond your imagination. Because you cannot imagine the infinite. You cannot imagine a universe that had no beginning in time. You talked about end times, a universe that has no ending in time, a universe has, that has no ages in space. God is ineffable. It's the greatest mystery of existence. For you to define God and give him these simple qualities is to actually limit God. God is beyond good and evil. God is transcendent. I'm just wondering, I'm hearing a lot about your experience. Your experience of what's true, you're talking about gravity and electromagnetic forces, and that's, you know, more true somehow than her experience of God, his experience of God. My real, physical, personal experience with God 
How is my experience less enlightened, it's not. less real? Your, less, your experience is not less than mine. I can only talk about my experience and how I see the world. And to answer your question, the simplest answer will be, God is as you are. So then, when you say God that... God is our highest instinct to understand ourselves. What makes that more true? It doesn't. I... It's my interpretation. I can so... only express my experience. I'm not denying you your experience. Your experience is But you're saying God... that yours is more enlightened than mine. No, mine is more, more consistent with our understanding of biology and our understanding of evolution and our understanding of the laws of nature, in my opinion. In your opinion? In my opinion. I can only voice my opinion, not yours. Great. Okay, so my opinion can't be true. Sure. You have a right to yes, your opinion. Yes, he is. <laughs> That's exactly what he's saying. That's what you want to think. No, he's... That's what I'm you want to think. I'm not questioning your truth. I'm saying that Jesus is your savior and his savior and their savior. I'm saying Jesus is true for everyone. And if you don't believe in him, you don't get to be with him. In that case, I feel really sorry for you. All right. I want you to be saved. And I want you to be saved. <laughs> Do we oh. need to rescue Jesus? It's, it's Seattle, Washington. You are defending Jesus. You're trying to rescue Jesus. Is he in so much trouble? What? That he needs you to rescue him? Then why are we even having this conversation? Why would you come here tonight if not to attack him? Jesus? I've written two books on Jesus. Please read them. Maybe I will. Hi, my name is Patrick Brockman. Um, Pastor Mark, my question is really to have a better understanding. Um, I've heard your side uh, indicate that Satan can't move through someone who has been saved. That's what Annie said. Okay, do you believe that? Um, what I believe is, part of this is, and I, I agree with part of what, not, not much, but part of what Carlton said in that we can't blame the devil for everything. And, and that was the first thing that, that happened when sin happened. We try to blame him for everything. Now, in my understanding, we can't blame him for the decisions we make, the errors we make, the injustice we commit, but we can be influenced. If, he, if we're lied to, if we choose to believe the lie, then we're morally culpable. We can be tempted to do something, but if we choose to do it, we're morally responsible for that action. And knowing that there's things like lies and temptations helps us to, to live the life that we are intended to live by God by resisting those forces, knowing that they're not, they're not good. Uh, my question's for Deepot. My name is Jeremy Eccles. Um, you were talking about the levels of enlightenment and that there's an evolution of enlightenment, but to balance out uh, evil, that there's a corresponding, that evil and the diabolical, diabolical forces come to that level. And so there's always going to be this struggle and evolution uh, of enlightenment always stays slightly ahead. By definition, isn't evolution change in advance? And if they're always at the same corresponding level, what is the point of evolution of enlightenment? No, actually, there are forces of creativity and forces of entropy, and there's tension between them. If you had only evolutionary forces, the universe would rapidly burn itself up and disappear into the heat death of absolute zero. If there were only destructive forces, the universe would rapidly collapse into a black hole before you could say Jesus Christ. So you need these forces to keep creation going. Evolution is always ahead, which means the good guys keep winning, but they never win, and the bad guys keep losing, but they never lose, and so the universe goes on. If, if, if one side or the other won, end of story. They need each other. So with those corresponding levels, then, then it's not evolution because there is no change and there is no real advance. Anymore. No, there is evolution. You are an example of it. Your ancestors were monkeys. So says you. But, but nonetheless, with the realm of good and evil, there is no change. None. I'd rather so not, not call it good and evil. I'd rather call it creativity and uh, lack of uh, knowledge and ignorance. So there's... The, there's ignorance on one side, and there is enlightenment on the other. And our goal is to seek the enlightenment that Jesus spoke of when he said, all things that I do, you shall do as well. You know what's abide in me, and as I abide in you. I am in you, you are in me, I and the Father are one. 
this is, he used the language of his time, which was the language of the Hebrews, because that's all he knew. If your mind is the product of evolutionary consciousness and development, how do you trust it so implicitly? I don't trust my mind. I trust my spirit, which is beyond my mind. My mind is full of contradictions and paradoxes and definitions and labels and judgments and good and evil. I don't trust my mind at all, but I do trust my spirit, which is beyond all of this. Okay, then let me ask you a question. This leads to a very practical question. Annie, I hope I'm not giving away your story. You, at one point, you were abducted. Mm -hmm. You were uh, tied up. Yes. You were stripped naked. Yes. You were beaten for seven hours. Yes. All the hair was shaved off of your head. Yes. And you were repeatedly raped by how many men? There were six people there. Six people there. Okay. Would you call that evil? Yes, or I would a call lack it, of consciousness no, I would call, and necessary for evolutionary development. I would development. call it the psychosis of our collective mind. I would call it bad. Yes, of course, <laughs> but bad can be psychotic too. You know, you have to you have to understand the context in which evil arises instead of just labeling it and be done with it. Okay, so that happens to her. Yes. What's the attributable cause? What's the attributable cause? Her, you know, abuse possibly in her environment. Uh, no, for the people, the men who did this to her, the people They who, were probably abused in turn by their parents. What if they weren't? What if they're just bad? You know, when you look into the history of violence, you will find it always has a history of abuse in the back. Not always. In the past. Not Absolutely. always. Not always. We've so dastardly misused the name of Jesus and Christ and Christianity and justified it through the scriptures because we presume that God is violent enough to torture billions of people infinitely. That is, that is against the very moral character of God. But we believe in a God who will ultimately get all of his enemies that we're supposed to love ours, but he's going to torture his forever. That whole concept is obscene. But I preached it, and I think I had some measure of the anointing. I stood in this in a pulpit with my Bible open and preach the conviction of the Holy Ghost after coming off of a 40-day fast. And I said some very hurtful and arrogant and ignorant things, but I did it from the bottom of my heart, and I sent people bleeding and some suicidal. I wasn't sensitive. I missed it. My heart was right. My spirit was, but my head was screwed up. And most fundamentalists in any religion are, 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 their, their thinking is obscure to say that the loving God who even after all that Mel Gibson said Jesus went through that's pretty dastardly but he did it history says Christian history says and still most of the folks Deepak because he hasn't confessed Christ is supposed to go to hell I love him but I don't think I have the capacity yet to love him like I believe God does. I can't see him in hell. Do you know Mahatma Gandhi used to carry the Sermon on the Mount with him all the time? And he lived it. He lived it. And he was responsible for bringing down the fall of the British Empire without a single bullet. So he lived the truth. If somebody is pointing at the moon, look at the moon. Don't worship the finger. I would like to uh, give everybody a chance to just wrap it up in a minute or so. And Annie, I miss you. I haven't heard from you in a little bit. So I'm going to start with you just to, to give us a sense of your closing thoughts as we end this. You know, I just, I'm so grateful to be here for one thing. And just hearing you guys talk, um, I get emotional because God is love. It's not about arguing. He exists and the devil exists. And they're both real and you can't have one without the other. In my personal experience, I believe this to be true. I can't say this for everyone in this audience or for the entire world, but I know that God's in my heart and I love people. And the only way I could see God was to know that the devil was real. And that's my truth that God's shown me. Thank you. Thank you, Can we have a 60 second closing thought from you, if you will? <laughs> have you ever seen yourself through the eyes of somebody else you have become? Charles Darwin said, it is not the strongest of our species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but those most responsive to change. 
I am going through a, a spiritual renaissance where my expanded consciousness of God is so deep and so profound. I'm, I felt the tender. I think she's so tender. I just want to hug her. And I don't want to take away anything that is happening. It's so precious. And if it's working for you, sweetheart, don't let anything we say change it. It's beautiful. If it's got you off the street, if, if a counselor gets you off the street, that you don't call a demon, whatever helps you enhance your life, I'm for it. I think he's charming and smart and has a great work. And I think Deepak is going to bring together, because I've really been in your camp for so many years. This man is tricking my, he's a scientist, and so I'm listening, I'm learning, and I'm, I'm in growing. And I would say to all the audience, give it some thought. Uh, again, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Be willing to expand. We can learn from him. He is evidently learned in the ways of some of the things we talk about, Jesus. He can learn from me. We're going to hang out together. I love the man. I, 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 I want to learn from him. And I think he'll learn something from us. And I appreciate what you're doing. I think this was an excellent night. I think that the whole America that will listen to this will just think. Don't get mad. Nobody's attacking Jesus. Um, we love Jesus. Ma Mahatma Gandhi said, I may have become Christian if it were not for Christians. Um, <laughs> so I'm just trying to represent the Christ consciousness, the Christ person, the Christ culture in a way that's not so violent because I don't believe that's the spirit of Christ and it's certainly not the Prince of Peace. So uh, I, I dismiss this, this monster that we call a devil that has so pervaded the thinking of people and then they proliferate that whole consciousness of evil and vice and demons. But if that works for you and you need a demon and you need the devil, have him. I would encourage you to try to find something else. On the subject uh, of is Satan real? And after this discussion we've had tonight, which I think has been incredibly fascinating, I just want to give you a chance to, to wrap it up from your perspective. I'm just going to read and leave it at that. Uh, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. I'll just leave it at that. And a, a final thought from you, Deepa. Well, I'm going to quote something that is a paraphrasing of something that was found in the Egyptian desert. goes back to the time of the Essenes. The Essenes were a mystical people, and many people do believe that Jesus was influenced by the Essenes. And so I'm going to quote from that. And this is a man who's had a direct experience of God. And he says, you split me and you tore my heart open and you filled me with love. You poured your spirit into mine. I knew you as I know myself. My eyes are radiant with your light. My ears delight in your music. My nostrils are filled with your fragrance and my face is covered with your dew. You have made me see all things shining. You have made me see all things new. You have granted me perfect ease and I have become like paradise. If you want to get rid of Satan, be intoxicated with that kind of love. It is, it is, it is never easy and it is never comfortable to have your core beliefs challenged, but it is healthy. And uh, I very much appreciate you coming out and sharing that with us. So thank you to our panel. We very much appreciate it. And thank you to all of you. Thank 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 you.